All right, hello. So we are going to continue our discussion of Chapter 11, finishing up with periodic trends. So first of all, you know, what is a trend? Think about fashion trends. Uh, it's a tendency towards some sort of style. And so we are going to talk about how the periodic table also shows trends. Uh, and along with fashion, you know, all the 80s fashions are coming back. So not only is fashion trendy, but it's also periodic. So as you can see, everything relates to the periodic table. Okay, so let's review before we get into trends. So we've talked so far about the wave mechanical model, talking about principal energy levels, and then the sublevels within those, and then orbitals, and how the electrons fit within that model. And then from there, we went to electron configuration, so how to fill those lower energy levels before moving up to the higher ones. And then specifically, we talked about valence electrons, or the outer electrons, that are involved in bonding and also contribute to properties of elements. And that's kind of what we're going to talk more about today. Along with this, we're going to include effective nuclear charge, which is the positive pull from the protons that electrons feel. And along with that, electron shielding, which if you look at an example of, let's say, a Bohr model, we know that two electrons fit in the first shell and up to eight in the second shell. And so these first two electrons are very close to the nucleus. They're feeling the pull of the protons more, and they are shielding these outer electrons from the pull of the nucleus. And so those two topics are going to relate to the trends that we're going to discuss today. So the first trend is atomic size. So as you can see, whoops, as we go down a group, atomic size increases. Now this is due to the fact that we are adding more electrons, but we're also adding more protons. So you might say, well, if we're adding more protons, then they should be pulling on the electrons, making the atoms smaller, when in reality it's larger. And this is due primarily to those increase in principal energy levels. So as we increase from one energy level to two to three, as we go down a group, those valence electrons or those outer electrons are getting further away from the nucleus. They're being more shielded by the inner electrons, and so they're experiencing less of an effective nuclear charge. This allows them to become further away and less pulled in by the protons. So as we go down a group, atomic size will increase. Now as we go across from left to right, you can see that atomic size is decreasing. As we go across, we are adding electrons, and we're also adding protons in this case as well. But the thing that's different is that we are not changing principal energy level. We're staying within the same energy level the entire way that we go across. And so now those outer electrons are not being shielded as much as they were when we were going vertically. And so the protons can exhibit a larger effective nuclear charge and really pull in tightly on those electrons, making the atoms smaller and making those electrons very tightly held. Well, this relates to our second trend, which is ionization energy. This is the energy required to remove an electron from an individual atom in the gas phase. So how much energy does it take to remove an electron? Okay, well, let's think back to size and also types of elements, metals and nonmetals. Metals will have a low ionization energy. You think about where metals are on the periodic table. They're on the left and in the center. As we go down a group, we know that the atom size gets bigger. Those electrons, those outer electrons, are further away from the nucleus. They're less tightly held. They're going to be very easy to remove. Okay, as we think about nonmetals, nonmetals have a high ionization energy. We know they take up the upper right side of the periodic table. As we go across the period, atomic size decreases. Those electrons are held much more tightly by the nucleus, and so it's going to be much more difficult to remove an electron from a nonmetal or from this right side of the periodic table than it will be to remove it from a nonmetal, or sorry, backwards. The, it'll be much more difficult to remove from a nonmetal or the right side of the periodic table than it would be to remove from a metal or the left side where they're larger and less tightly held. Okay, so our third trend is electronegativity, and this is the ability of an atom in a molecule to attract shared electrons to itself. And so within a bond, you know, and we will, the next section we're going to discuss are the types of bonds, and so how are those electrons being shared within that bond? And so these quantities are based on the Pauling scale, which uh, was put together by Linus Pauling, who's a famous chemist. And he uh, noticed that fluorine was very electronegative, meaning it really attracted those electrons to itself in a bond. And so he gave it a value of 4 and then scaled every other element from that value. Electronegativity increases as we move from left to right and as we go from bottom to top. As you can see, we've got uh, this is 
like a periodic table bar graph. And so you can see that the fluorine it has a much higher electron activity than other uh, elements, especially to the left and lower. These differences are due to electron configuration. And if you'll notice, we're missing, or they're here, but they're not really part of the scale, the noble gases. Well, if you think back to the Bohr model and what we talked about with electron configuration, noble gases have a full outer shell. They are very stable. They're not, number one, going to want to participate in many bonds, nor are they going to really pull on those electrons because they already have a full outer shell. So let's look at some elements that are not noble gases. For example, sodium versus chlorine. So if I do sodium's electron configuration, it is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1. Well, if I look at its valence electron, it only has one valence electron. Remember those electrons in the highest energy level. Well, that's not very stable. Sodium would rather lose this electron, which is why sodium as a metal has a very low ionization energy and a low electronegativity because it's not going to be very good at attracting shared electrons within a bond to itself. And so if it gets rid of this electron and becomes the sodium one plus ion, then its electron configuration is similar to the previous noble gas, which in this case would be neon, and so now it is much more stable. Let's look at the opposite example. Let's look at a nonmetal such as chlorine. Chlorine's electron configuration is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p5. Now if I look at its valence electrons, it has seven. Eight would make a stable third shell, and so it would be more likely to gain one electron, making this electron configuration very similar to argon, which would make it much more stable. So chlorine has a much higher electronegativity because it's really going to, and a much higher ionization energy because it's going to want that additional electron to make its outer shell stable. So from here, we're going to move on to electron configuration of ions, which we briefly touched on already. We're going to look at how electronegativity plays a role in determining bond type bond dipole, and then also molecular polarity and molecular geometry. Okay, so let's summarize the three trends that we have discussed. So I would draw, this is my beautiful periodic table, look how wonderful it is. So my first trend was atomic size. Now I'm a very visual learner, um, so you could draw a map like this or whatever you feel is going to be the best way for you to summarize. I would draw a gigantic atom in the lower left and a very tiny atom in the upper right because I know that that is the trend for atomic size and then from there I, I can figure out that okay as I go up it's going to um, decrease and as I go this way it's going to decrease so atomic size decreasing but really the arrows don't do as much for me as that picture does let's change colors and now let's do ionization energy. Well, I know if the atom is really small that the ionization energy is really large because it's really difficult to remove those electrons. And I know if it's really large that that ionization energy is really tiny because those electrons are so far away from the nucleus and very easy to remove. So our third trend, let's change colors again. Oh, let's do, how about orange? Was electronegativity. I know that electronegativity is very big where ionization energy is very large because electronegativity, its ability to attract an electron within a the bond, these nonmetals are going to be much better at attracting electrons than these very large metals, and so they're going to have a very small electronegativity. So hopefully this is a good way for you to summarize these three trends and be able to explain how and why they occur. Okay, so for practice, be sure you write a summary of these notes so we can discuss them together. Then we're going to work on a pogol to help solidify some of these concepts. You'll have a couple choices for a graphing lab that we're going to look at with trends, then a couple choices for practice, and when you're ready, we'll take the quiz. Have a good day.